Hey guys, at 9.30 every Sunday morning, we're all used to coming to our small groups. And uh, because of our pandemic and what's going on in the world, we're being isolated from one another. So we thought we would try something new. We thought we would have group time at 9.30. And uh, Brother Steve's going to teach us today to about, for about 15 minutes. And then each Sunday, we're going to enlist one of our small group leaders to teach during this time, 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, Brother Steve, you take it now. Good morning and welcome to Western Carolina Small Group Worship Time. You know, we're saddened by the absence of our small group gatherings and being able to come together. Acts 2 and, uh, describes how we uh, should come together as a church, gives us guidance to how the church should operate. And that was to assemble, pray together, study together, spend time together in love, and support one another. And it's kind of difficult uh, doing that from afar, but we still can. Hebrews 10, uh, 23 through 25 says this, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised us is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. So that's a reading of uh, Hebrews 10, 23 through 25, if you want to look back to that. You know, God knew this time was coming to us. Uh, he knew that uh, the, the coronavirus was coming to the world, was coming to America, was coming to Western Carolina Church here in Spruce Pine. He knew all this, and, and yet... He made this statement that we should assemble. Now, God also knew that uh, we would have the media uh, availability to do the things that uh, we can't hardly do uh, in person. He knew that we had, uh, had uh, systems in place, things in place. He knew that would be here when the time came. So God knows all. You know, we have cell phones, we have laptops, we have uh, the ability to to Skype, FaceTime, Facebook, and e even call one another on the phone, which people don't do a lot anymore, but, but we can do those things and still be in contact and still be together. Uh, obviously, this is not the way of choice, uh, but it is a way that God has given us to allow us to come together and worship together and fulfill this, uh, this uh, uh, obligation that he gave us through uh, Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. You know, this is the right thing to do. Uh, it's not the, uh, the easiest way, but uh, it's the right thing to do uh, and to overcome the attack. We know that separation is part of how we overcome the, this, and we must do that. We must work together to ensure also that we prevent an epidemic of fear. I know just, just within myself, it seems like there's a constant urge to, to be afraid in this time and I, this is this is worldwide it's not just me and it's not just you uh, it's worldwide everyone's afraid and we must overcome that now how do we overcome that as a church is by being to, together uh, and, and being in unity and we again we can't do it personally and physically but we can do it by uh, all the means that we have made available to us each of us are feeling the effects of this coronavirus. Uh, no question about it. <clears throat> but still yet, you know, even though it's in every corner of our lives, uh, uh, the way to overcome it is, is staying true to the worship of, of our loving God. With, with fear comes anxiety, uh, uncertainty, confusion, and anger. This is not of God. This is of Satan. Each of us are feeling the effects of the coronavirus, just as I said, it is in every corner of our lives and certainly appears that it will be for some time to come. Each of us must make the best decisions we can to protect our loved ones and ourselves by using the common sense God placed in us and also by being obedient to God's word and listening to those in authority and those most knowledgeable in fighting this virus and, and follow what they tell us to do and be safe. 
So what do we do? The Bible teaches that health involves the, the restoration and strengthening of one's personal relationship with God. A healthy lifestyle includes pursuing healthy relationships, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, with family and others, and most importantly, with God himself. We have the means of doing that even though we cannot come together at a place of worship. We can use the means God has provided through technology and continue to grow in our relationship with God. But not forsaken the listening of inspirational gospel music uh, by selecting and listening to Bible teachers and preachers who speak the truth of the word and personal study of God's word while continuing in prayer. These are the ways that we can continue to grow. 1 Corinthians 10, 23 tells us whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, do it all for the glory of God. In Jeremiah 33, 6, we read, Nevertheless, I will bring health and healing to it. I will heal my people and let them enjoy abundant peace and security. Now, the God, time God was speaking uh, this to Jeremiah, it was proposed for the children of Israel, but, but we know that all Scripture is to inform us, to grow us, to teach us. And this Scripture is, is like that. As I passed through the house one morning this week, I noticed a little round magnet on our refrigerator door. I hadn't, hadn't really paid any attention to it before. And it said three simple words, God's got this. In other words, God is in control. And I realized that this was true of everything, including our present battle with this, this virus. And I'd kindly forgotten that, that God was in control because so much was going on, so much was being said in the news media that you get all worked up and you get anxious. But those three words, God's got this. And he has. He's got full control in our lives. Even though this is a time of stress and anxiety and fear and confusion, as we reach out in prayer to our God, if he will bring spiritual strength and healing in our anxieties and fears and give us a healthy supply of peace and feeling of security, assuring our hearts and minds that he, our loving God, is in full control of our lives. I think that's what Jeremiah 33 says to us today. So I encourage all of, all of us to stand firm, knowing, as Philippians 4.13, we can do all things through him who gives us strength. I believe this is saying we can weather this storm. And his help, with his help, because he loves us and, and he will give us strength, we need to face the future. We find in the 13th chapter of Hebrews that we should be content with what our situation is, for we have the promise that he will never desert or forsake us, that we can say with confidence, I refuse to be afraid because the Lord is my helper and my keeper. Hebrews 12, 12 through 13 says this, and it gives us these instructions. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled but rather healed. As we look at this statement in the book of Hebrews, we realize that the writer was talking about the, the disciplines of the Father. Now, I'm not saying that this virus is, is God's discipline because I believe that it is here because of the fall of man, back, all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And it's, it's like all other bad things that we face in this world. It all started there. It is from the Father of lies, harm and evil, and that being Satan. But certainly God can, can allow it to take place and use it to get Christians' attention as, as there are many Christians who walk a path that makes it hard to determine whether they're truly Christians or of the world. And God will discipline those following such a path. This may be a time that he pulls those back to where they should be. We are told here if we're weak then we will need to exercise and become stronger. This is spiritually spiritual exercise and we we cannot give up or give in to fear and anxiety due to the events around us but keep on running the race although the the track racetrack itself has changed uh, and it certainly has we must keep running let us continue to worship together as western carolina church by coming together in small group meetings such as we're having this morning 
with worship and, and, and praise worship through song and, and then being present for the message that will be coming each week. Satan has tried to stop the church from coming together and grow in the, in the relationship with our Lord uh, ever since the church came into existence almost 2,000 years ago. And he has failed over and over. And he will fail this time as well. May the peace of God fill you in every area of your life. You know, we look forward to sharing with you and as in the next weeks uh, through these small group meetings. It is our desire that you will come together and, and watch them uh, each week and contact us through phone and text uh, and let us know what you would like, what you need. You know, our plan is, is, is a rotation of our small group leaders, uh, each one to present a lesson from God's Word each week until we can actually come together again. You know, while our world uh, is slow, it gives us a wonderful opportunity to build our relationships with one another through phone calls or texting. But even more exciting, this gives us the opportunity to spend quality time with our Lord through prayer and the study of his word as, as we learn more of him and our relation with him grows stronger. All of this can be a time that's well spent. Other times in our life, we just don't have the time that we now have had forced on us. Please be ready with your Bibles and pray for your leaders and all your small group members. Contact them. Call them. Let them know that you're uh, you're there and that you're thinking about them and love them. Uh, again, please be ready with your Bible and pray for your leaders and your small group members each week. Continue to do that. Let us be the light of a world filled with darkness. Let the good be us from all the bad that's around us. Christians coming closer to each other and closer to our Lord and the loss of the world finding hope and peace through the risen Lord by the light that we shine. Love all of you. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, holy, holy, holy is your name. I pray your kingdom would enlarge as many come to you in this time of struggle. As your will is being accomplished for all good. For those called according to your purpose. We ask of you only that which we need and protect us from greed. We thank you for forgiveness. You by your grace have given us. Help us grow in grace so we would have a forgiving heart towards those that would offend us. Protect us from these difficult trials of life while protecting us from the evil one. To you we will give all praise for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hey, thank you, Brother Steve. I want to invite all of you back next Sunday at 930 uh, for another group leader who will come and, and lead us in our small group time for about 15 to 20 minutes. Thank you.
Although, I think a selfie video is more my speed as opposed to holding a microphone on the stage recording, so we're going to give that a shot. Um, I heard a quote this week that says, spatially we're divided, but spiritually we're united. And I think that's very fitting for this time we're living in. Um, I mean, I'm in the shed where I make soap, um, recording a video for Mitch to put on YouTube for the congregation to watch on Sunday, so that in itself is kind of a strange thing. Um, and I think it's easy to feel isolated during this time. It's easy to feel alone, um, which is kind of increases the need for corporate worship and feeling like we're together. And um, so over the next few weeks, we just want to be creative and finding ways to make the congregation feel engaged and um, just kind of keep that sense of community that we have during that worship time at church. And because um, we can, you know, we can either just kind of resist the urge to um, to adapt and to change, or we can adapt and change um, during this crazy time. And so we want to be proactive in being able to just adapt and make the changes we need to make so that we can continue to worship together corporately um, and that we don't feel isolated, we don't feel alone. And so um, as we sing this morning, um, one of the songs we're singing says, You are here, moving in our midst. You know, and it's easy to feel like that's meaningless when we're sitting in our houses separate. Um, but if we really think about those words and that, and we sing those words with meaning, then we we are connected. We are united um, through the Spirit that lives in each one of us. Um, and so, as we sing that this morning, I just encourage you to think about that. That um, it isn't about just watching, but it's about being engaged in that worship time. Good morning and welcome to Western Carolina Church. This is a little bit out of the ordinary. Uh, I'm standing here basically by myself. I just got off work. It is pre-recorded. Mitch is going to splice it together because he knows how to do that kind of stuff. But we still wanted to do a welcome, and we wanted to welcome you to Western Carolina Church, even if you are in your living room being welcomed to Western Carolina Church. Uh, I myself truly miss being a part of this. I miss y'all's faces, and I miss being able to worship hand in hand with everybody. So on the welcome, I don't have a whole lot to welcome other than what I normally say is if you need to use the bathroom, but if you're in your house, you can go wherever you normally go. So that's a, that's a funny joke. So, But again, welcome. Blessed to be able to do this even from afar and miss everybody, love everybody, and I'm going to pray. Thank you, God, for this day. Thank you for letting us be a part of each other's lives, God, even if we have to worship from afar, God. Thank you for uh, allowing me to stand here, God. Thank you during all this that our families are close, our church families are close, our uh lives are going on from a distance god please continue to be with the people that this is affecting uh, even the business owners that are losing business and the people that are losing their lives the people that are struggling with their health god i just want to thank god for my church family and my family and all the people that reach out and all the love that goes let me pray amen
Stop working, we make a miracle work. 
stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Hey guys, welcome to Western Carolina Church, our online service. I brought a friend with me. Uh, some of you might recognize him. His name is, uh, well, the ball's name is Wilson, and you remember Castaway Tom Hanks. He was on the island alone. So uh, because of his isolation, he made a new friend. And, and out of this Wilson ball, his new friend was Wilson. And uh, so I brought Wilson along with me today, even though I'm preaching to you and teaching you uh, there's no one in the auditorium, so I thought I'd put Wilson right here and uh, let and pre let let him be one I preach to. And I don't think Wilson's going to be still enough to preach to, so I'll leave him to the side. Well, I'm just trying to relax myself, I guess. But uh, to be honest, I, I miss all of you. I miss Sunday mornings. I, I miss coming up. I miss greeting everyone. I miss Toby and Susie's breakfast. Uh, I miss staying after church and, and greeting and, and, and talking and listening. Uh, one thing that I did not know uh, about from, last, from the last two weeks, today is the third uh, service uh, of being online. And, and one thing I did not know uh, is that the kids uh, watch this. And I talked to some of the parents, and they were telling me uh, that their kids watch. So what I'm going to do, if the kids are around you, great. Stay right there, kids. If not, uh, gather them up. I'm going to do something fun with the kids in just a, a little bit. And I'm so thankful, not only our kids, but our high school students and our college students and young adults and all the way through our senior citizens are taking time uh, to come together on Sunday morning. And even though we are apart, we are together through the Holy Spirit. Uh, I was amazed that uh, last uh, two weeks ago, I was looking at the online viewers of someone shared this with me, that we had 142 views uh, so far on our first online service. And that truly represents our average attendance. We run about 140 to 160 every Sunday. And uh, I know for some of those views, like an individual view, it might be three or four people watching it. So I'm very grateful to God and to you that you take time to watch. I want to make one more announcement before we actually go into the sermon today. Uh, some of you have asked and, uh, and, and inquired, you want to continue to worship in your tithes and offerings. And uh, we have provided a, a new way to do that. You can go online at Western Carolina Church, and there's a, a link that it says Give Online. If you're uncomfortable doing that, uh, you can always just send a check, or you can do online bill pay. Uh, but that's for you who want to continue in worship and giving. Uh, as always, we do not push giving. We, we teach about giving. We teach about tithing. Uh, but we do not manipulate or push people to give. Giving is between you and God. All right, let's get your Bibles out and turn with me to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And I hope your children are around. Uh, I'm going to get a few of my props up here. Something fun I'm doing with the kids here. Well, I hope you guys have fun with this. Uh, I was thinking about <clears throat> the sermon today and uh, Jesus being the light. And we're going to talk about that. But first, I want you to turn to John chapter 1. And many of you are there now. And we're going to do a lot of reviewing today. But in John chapter 1, we're talking about mission and purpose or purpose and mission. Purpose is why do I exist? Mission is how do I accomplish my purpose? In John chapter 1, you have your Bibles open. We find the purpose and mission of, of Jesus. We find the purpose and mission of John the Baptist. And we find the purpose and mission of the disciples. And we're looking at their mission and their purpose. And through this study and series, we're going to look at why God placed us here on earth. And, and, and the purpose and the mission of what he has for each one of us. And uh, if you are a young child uh, watching this, I want you to listen to me very carefully. If you can understand what I'm saying. If you're four and five years of age, six, seven, whatever age you are, God has a purpose for your life. He has a mission for your life. Uh, I remember when I was nine years old, the Lord used to speak to my heart about what he wanted me to do in life, and I'm doing it now. 
And uh, so he does speak to us while we're young. If you're in high school or, or college and career or young adult or a senior citizen, God has purpose for your life and a mission for you. And if you're going through uh, pain and sorrow right now, God has purpose. He has mission for you to accomplish while you're going through this sorrow or grief. God has purpose for you. If you're losing economically because of the pandemic that we're in, uh, God has purpose for you. If you're suffering from anxiety, stress, discouragement, oppression, depression, God has purpose and mission for you. God can work good out of anything bad. And, and the reason God works good out of anything bad because he's a good God. And uh, God deserves our worship. He wants us to glorify him. So uh, in looking at today's text, uh, we're all aware of what's happening in our world. We're all aware of what's happening in America and in and, and North Carolina and in Mitchell County. But in all of this, just remember that God can be trusted. We can keep looking to him. All right, so let's get back to the basics. So the purpose of Christ is to bring light and life. That was the first sermon two weeks ago. So for all the kids, uh, I want to. I have two balloons here. And I have a helium tank, and I hope it has helium in it. I tried it a while ago. But uh, I want to illustrate to you the difference between having Christ and the difference of not having Christ as far as who he is. So first of all, let's blow up a balloon here. This is, I hope it doesn't pop. Whoop! it's making a bad sound. Ugh. I got just a little bit of helium left. All right, so let's just say... I can tie this. All right, so we have just a normal balloon, right? All right, so I'm going to put that there. Whoa. All right. And then we have, look, a light. Isn't that cool? Come on, helium, blow it up. Oh, that's good. All right. So, we're going to turn the lights out at this time. You see the light? Okay. So, see the balloon I'm holding up? The one without a light? Okay. I'm holding it up. You cannot see the balloon without a light because there's no light. All right? So, you really can't enjoy watching this balloon or even seeing the balloon because there's no light. But God sent Jesus into the world and he died on the cross for us to provide life and light. And with, with, with light, we can see and we're guided and we can know why God put us here and we know the reason we exist and he can reveal and he will reveal to us how to accomplish while we're here on earth. So let's turn the lights back on. And I'm going to lay, I guess I'll just lay the balloons over here. Maybe they won't pop. <laughs> I hope they don't. So anyway, so the purpose of Christ was to give light and life. I hope your Bibles are open. And uh, if the kids are with you, and uh, I, let them read along with you. In John chapter 1, it says, In the beginning... There was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were made by Him, and nothing was made without Him. In Him there was life, and that life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overpowered it. So that was two weeks ago, and the purpose of Christ was to give light and life. And then last week, look at verses 5 through 9. Uh, John the Baptist says there was a man named John who was sent by God. He came to tell people the truth about the light so that through him all people could hear about the light and believe. John was not the light, but he came to tell people the truth about the light. The true light that gives light to all was coming into the world. Now, let me go back. And then I'll, get, I'll tell you what, let's change this, this guy, Wilson. Let's change his name to John the Baptist <laughs> for my, another illustration here. So here's John the Baptist, and you say, oh, he looks kind of rough. The Bible says he was kind of rough in his character and the way he looked. And he came, he was sent by God to prepare for the light, Jesus. 
And John the Baptist says, I'm not the true light. He is the true light. Christ is. But I'm announcing his coming. I'm preparing for him. So that's a great example of John the Baptist. What was his purpose? His purpose was to prepare people for the light. Jesus, the purpose of Jesus was to get light and life. And the purpose of John the Baptist was to use his voice uh, to announce the life and light. So I'm going to chunk those right over there. Whew. Now everything's cleared off the table. Good job on that camera work, Mitch. All right, so if Jesus came to be the light and the life, I want you to look at your Bibles in John chapter 1, and I want you to look at verse 6. I'm going to give you four responses to Christ, to that light, okay? Uh, Christ came as the light, and there's four responses. Look at verse 6. First of all, John gave witness to the light. That's number one. That's the first response. Verse 6, there was a man sent from God named John. He came as a witness to testify to the light. Number two, the world did not recognize the light. That's the second response to Jesus. Look at verse 10 in your Bibles. It says, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Now, I want you to think about this verse. He was in the world. The light was in the world, but the world did not recognize the light. So how do you do that? If you're in a dark room and someone turns the lights on, how do you recognize the light? If you're blind, you don't see the light. So that's what was happening when Jesus came. There were a lot of people who were blinded by darkness, and Jesus came as the light. But yet people could not see Jesus because they were blinded. And the only way we can see the light is through uh, Christ revealing that to us. He gives us the capacity to see it. And if he doesn't give us the capacity to see his light, then we're blind. Uh, and we need the Holy Spirit to reveal the light. So the world did not recognize the light. I'm going to give an illustration. I'm going to ask right now for Mitch to just darken the screen. Okay? So the screen, you cannot see me. But the lights are still on right here. But you cannot see me or the light. All right? So you're blind. Even though you hear me, you're blind. And in blindness, uh, you cannot see. Uh, you really don't know what's going on. You kind of do because you hear me. But the lost world, when Jesus came, when it says the world did not recognize the light they were blinded they were blinded to the light so let's let's turn the uh, darkness off and turn the the uh, screen back on now you can see and the reason you can see and I can see today uh, literally we can see because it's been turned back on but the reason we can see is because Christ has given us the light all right so number one John gave witness of the light number two the world did not recognize the light and then number three, the third response to the light is in verse 11. His own did not receive the light. Look at verse 11. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. This says he came to his own, the people who already knew God back in the Old Testament, his own, the Israelites, the Jews. But uh, when Christ came, they turned a blind eye to him. They saw the light. And here's a good way to illustrate this is this point. Let's say Christ, you know, he is the light. Okay, we'll kill the lights again this time. Kill that match. All right, so Christ is in the world. Let's take the light. Oh, there's the other little light over there we made from the balloon. But let's put this here. All right, so there's the light of Christ. And it says his own, his own people, the people of the Old Testament, their generation, their descendants. They knew the Old Testament. They, they knew prophecy. But when Jesus finally came, they, they saw that light. But you know what they did? They, they turned their back to the light. And they went unto themselves. And, 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 and they reasoned. They followed their own truth. They turned their back. So that's what that clause means. Let's turn the lights back on. His own did not receive the light. Uh, John 1.12 says... But then it says there were some who did receive the light. And that's the fourth response. That's people like you and I, or you and me. Some received the light, and they're children of God. Look at verse 12. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now, as I look at verse 12, what does that mean to be a child of God? It, it means I'm his son or daughter. Now, look at verse 13. 
They did not become his children in any human way, by any human parents or human desire. They were born of God. Now, verse 13 is critical. It's important because just as we had nothing to do with our physical birth, we had nothing to do with our spiritual birth. We can't take credit for it. We can't boast in our wise decision to say, I got saved or I said a prayer and I'm going to be going to heaven because I, I, I. We cannot boast in that. All the glory must go to God because God through Christ revealed the light. The Holy Spirit uh, revealed that light to us. We begin to see God for who God is. We begin to see ourselves for who we are. And we saw Christ for dying on the cross. And, and we went back to the cross and said, God, I'm sorry for my sins. I want you to forgive me. And God, in his glory, forgives us through his son. So, last today... We know the purpose of Christ. It was to give life and light. You've heard me say that a million times. But how did he accomplish his purpose? That would be his mission. How did he carry out giving light and life? Well, we know the story. He left heaven and came to earth, and he was born of a virgin Mary. Look at verse 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us for a while. Circle the word dwelt. The word dwelt or lived is a pretty interesting word. What that means in the Greek language is he tended among us for a while. He pitched his tent here for a while. Remember in the Old Testament, they had this thing called the tabernacle or a tent. And, and to worship God and to be with God, they went and worshiped God wherever the tabernacle or the tent. But here in the New Testament, when John was writing about Jesus, God coming into the world, he said, he came and tabernacled among us for a while. So I'm going to give you three things quickly and we'll be done. In the Old Testament, God showed his presence in the tabernacle. They built this tent or a temple, and, and that's where God's present, uh, presence lived. And when they wanted to worship God, they'd go to that place. Everyone went there once a year uh, or tried to because it was a very important place. It was a place of God's presence. God says his presence would be there in the middle of this tent or the temple. So that's the Old Testament. If you wanted to be in God or with God or in his presence, you went to the tent or you went to the tabernacle because God actually lived in a physical type containment. But number two, the second thing I want you to get to understand, when Jesus came into the world, God was present in our world in Jesus Christ. Okay, It wasn't just a revealing of his glory. It was God himself. So we go from a tent and a tabernacle now we have a real God human Jesus and that's where God is dwelling and then number three the third thing to understand now is that Jesus has left this world he told his disciples he said I'm going to go back to heaven but I'm going to leave my Holy Spirit that's me in spirit with you so the third thing to understand is now that Jesus has left this world God's presence is it in a tent a tabernacle or a church, God's presence is in us now. God's presence is is in us. He wants to be a part of our lives. Look at verse 16. From the fullness of his grace, we receive one blessing after another. For the law, circle the word law, was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to think about two words. I want you to think about the word law, and I want you to think about the word grace a lot of people think the law is a bad guy a black cat those kind of things negatives and they a lot of people look at grace as the good guy like the the guy with the white hat the guy that comes to the rescue but but neither the law or the grace are are bad guys listen to me law is a demand okay law is a demand and grace is supply so we have demand and supply we have the law and we have grace a supply and demand kind of thing law is demand and grace is supply so in the old testament when you see the law that's demand that's the ten commandments that's all the rules that's all the regulations if you want to be perfect if you're if you're going to go to heaven if you're going to be perfect on earth you've got to follow the law that's the law it's a demand God says, but let me lay it out for you. We couldn't do as humans what the law demands. So God supplied a diff- another, uh, 
he supplied a way to cover that. And it's grace. And grace came through Jesus Christ. We can't live up to the law. It's a standard. Okay, and it's set there to show us we can't live up to that law. We can try every day the rest of our life. But we'll never be able to live up to that law. So God sent Christ. God revealed himself in Christ here on earth to die on that cross, to shed blood, to die, to cover us not being able to fully follow the law. You say, well, Randy, I, I get that, but, but give me more. Okay, listen. If God is a perfect God, and if to go to heaven, to go to a perfect place, to be with a perfect God, you and I, we have to be perfect. I don't know about you, but I'll never be perfect. All right, so does that mean that I won't get to be with God in heaven? No. I'll, I'll get to be with God in heaven, not because I'm perfect, but because Jesus Christ came into me, and he forgave me, and he made me perfect. He made me right before his Father. Therefore, when I die and I go to heaven, it's not because of my works. It's not because of my goodness. It's not because I kept the law. I will go to heaven because of what Christ has done for me. Christ met the demand, or he supplied the grace. So grateful. Look at verse 18. It sums it up. No one has ever seen God, but God, the only Son, who is at the Father's side, he has made known to him. Now, I want you to circle in your Bible, he has made him known in verse 18. No one has ever seen God, but God, the only Son, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Made known him known. You know what the little word for made him known is? Exegeted. Now some of you know what the word exegete means. He has exegeted him. Sometimes we use this in Bible study. If you're going to do some exegesis in the Bible, that means we're, you, you and I, what we're going to do is bring it out into the open. Okay, that's what exegesis is. So, so in other words, who is, who is God? What is he like? So God was exegeted through Christ. He was made known through Christ. So, so when I say Christ and Jesus, some of you have, you should. We all have our ideals of Christ and Jesus, okay, from the Bible and all that, and our teachings. But then when I say the word God, sometimes what you think about God is, is not the way you think about Christ, See, God and Christ are the same. It's almost like we see Christ as the grace giver, and we see God as the law. And yet, they're both the same. We have the grace giver, and we have the law. We, we've already talked about that. But God wanted to reveal his uniqueness in that what we call attributes of God. God is perfect. God is just. Uh, God has anger. God has wrath. God also has grace, mercy, forgiveness. So when we study about Jesus in the New Testament, we're understanding about who God is. God was made known, exegeted through Christ. All right, so let's conclude today's service with where we started. Purpose. My purpose in life is to give God glory. We were created for God's glory. We're to be part of God's family, His church. We're to constantly grow in Christ, become like Christ. We're to serve the body of Christ. And we are to share His plan. We're to be a voice. We're to go on mission. We're to go on mission. We know the mission of Christ is to give light and life. We know the, uh, or the purpose. And we know the purpose of John the Baptist was to be a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, preparing for that light to come. Next week, we're going to talk about the purpose of the disciples, but, but let's look at our purpose. This is our purpose. But where, what is our mission? And this is where a lot of people uh, go through, uh, sometimes they go through confusion. They don't understand how to accomplish why God put them here. Uh, some people get frustrated because they feel like they're not giving their best to God. They don't know how to give their best. And uh, 
So over the next few weeks, we're going to really bring all this together and use God's words to help you understand your mission, how to get started accomplishing why God put you here. And it's going to be some uh, wonderful days ahead. Let's pray. Father, uh, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time that we've had to communicate your word. Father, there's a lot of stuff going on in this world. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of confusion. But we know in all the fear and confusion, we know where peace is found. It's found in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you for forgiveness of sins. And no matter how good it is here or how bad it is, We'll be at home with you one day in heaven. In your name we pray. Amen.